again. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for attending the BabTech Education Conference program. Before we get started, I'd like to share some of the other valuable information to assist your experience at FabTech. There are complimentary daily keynotes at 11 and leadership exchange panel discussions at 2 p.m. in the main floor theater. We would like to remind you there is a FabTech mobile app for download that will help in navigating around FabTech and provide some other valuable information about the show. There is a short paper survey placed about the classroom. Please take a minute to provide feedback on our session today. Your feedback is very important to us. Um, now, let's have some fun. My name is Patrick Coonan, and I am your first main presenter in today's session. So today, it will be a technical overview of tube bending and tube laser cutting. Um, my name is Patrick Coonan. I am a project engineer at Sharp Products in New Berlin, Wisconsin. A uh, quick background on me. Uh, so about, looking at about 12 years ago now, when I was at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee at going for mechanical engineering, I got a co-op at Bucyrus International Mining Company, and that's where my, um, my uh, manufacturing engineering uh, started. Um, so as I went through my co-op there, I moved into um, fast-paced manufacturing, getting into the sheet metal industry, um, everything from stamping to turrets to flat lasers. Um, from there, um, the co my company that I had been working at involved in sheet metal was getting involved in the tube industry. They asked me to um, go and, and, and learn the industry, um, and I said I would. And well, 12 years later, I'm, I'm heavily involved, and now I'm making some presentations on it. So. Uh, here we are, and I'm excited to be able to share some of the knowledge I have. Um, current role and responsibility, so I am head of, like I am the project engineer at Sharp, so I basically review all inquiries coming from customers. We're a job shop, so we do everything from under the sun, from one piece prototypes up to a thousand piece runs. So we analyze that, um, I review everything, and then I um, delegate the work out to our, our estimators, um, work with the customers on design for manufacturability, Things like that, because uh, you want to be able to cut costs but still provide the customer the parts they're looking for at a reasonable cost. Um, so that's my current role. Um, and now we'll move on. Um, before we get started, kind of get a gauge of what you guys all know. How many of you are familiar with tube lasering? Uh, okay. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> How many here today have worked with tube bending? No. Okay. And how many are brand new to these areas? Okay, so what we'll cover, applications. Uh, there's a lot of applications for, for tubing. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, we'll keep it interactive, it's a small group. So as I'm going along, if you have any questions or want more of a detailed diagram on what some of this tooling does do in the process, I can help draw to help clarify some things. Actually, you know what? It might be useful just to find out who everybody is in the room, just in case there's someone, <laughs> you know, it's fun to talk to if there's people involved in Research and development. Oh, it has people involved in certain companies and manufacture too. Mm -hmm. So, I, does that sound like an okay idea? Oh, well, you, well, we can have that conversation at the end. No, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. All right. Um, so, we have applications, uh, raw materials. There's raw materials, obviously, you have to start with something. So, you're, you're either going to a mill or a service center for your raw materials, whether they're stainlesses, aluminum, steels. Um, then there's tube bending, tooling cover that. Um, laser cutting pre and post bending. Um, there's laser equipment out there that now that can actually laser cut bent tubes. Um, challenges and benefits and then we'll go through Q&A but let's keep the Q&A uh, interactive while we're going through all this. Industries and applications. So there's a lot of industries um, that tubing goes into. There's chassis, exhaust, things like that. Um, so one for example is aerospace. So aerospace can be you know the wing frame. Um, there's tubing involved in the wing frame, exhaust systems, um, in aerospace, there's, there's tons of different uh, tubing applications in aerospace, agricultural um, structures, there's a lot of big structural tubes, rectangular square tubing um, in the agricultural industry. Auto truck and trailer, again, you're going to be in that more structural tube, um, but you will see now in the auto industry going to those high strength aluminums, uh, peanut shapes, um, size tubing. Um, which makes it more of a challenge to, to fabricate from the bending and laser side, um, just at a programming level. Um, fabrication companies, they use tubing for, for designing fixtures, carts, things like that. So we do um, sell a lot to just even fabrication companies for their in internal uses. 
food and beverage. Um, currently, uh, we're working on a, um, a tube that's free-formed, and it's got a it, it's got a swoop to it. Um, and a current co customer is actually um, filling bottles with it. So what it, the tube is designed to do is actually flip the bottle, get cleaned out, and then flip the bottle back over. And we use one of our free-formed vendors to form that tube um, over on the assembly line. Marine um, bilge pumps, exhaust systems again. You're not going to see it in the main boat itself, but more so back in the engine compartment. Medical carts, um, devices, um, there's all kinds of different carts, devices, um, medical beds, all use tubing. Um, we actually are, we were involved with um, tubing on an incubator in the medical industry, so it's just another example of where tubing is used, and it's just a front bumper on an incubator um, bed. And then recreation, recreations, chassis, bikes, snowmobiles, four-wheelers, UTVs, um, chassis, exhausts again, um, side frames, A-frames, all that. Um, so as you can see, tubing is involved in pretty much every industry. Um, even the chairs that you're sitting on, someone at the tube fabricator had to form the, the legs and then the, the, the back of the chair. All right, so we'll start with raw materials because that's where everything begins. And one of the first challenges with raw materials is sourcing it. And obviously, to source the material, you need to know what your EAUs are. So when it comes to sourcing, if it's a prototype, you're most likely going to a service center because you only need a few sticks to, to accomplish what it is you're, you're looking to do, um, which then ultimately drives the cost up. Now, if the job is more of a production run, quantities are much higher, now you can go to a mill and buy direct. A lot of times in the tubing industry, um, so flat sheets off of pounds in the tubing industry, you'll see a lot of your buys are off footage. So a lot of mill buys are, about, I, we usually see around 5,000 foot minimums is what dictates if we can go to the mill or if we have to go to a service center. Um, so a lot of our prototype jobs that, um, that, that you'll do, you'll probably have to go to a service center and pay a, pay a larger cost for the tubing. And then as, as that project would continue and you go to production, now you can look at going to a mill and, and driving your costs down to the customer and yourself. Material types that are involved, well, there's, there's all kinds of materials. There's brass, copper, uh, stainless steel, aluminum steels. And, then, and then inside those, there's all different grades. There's grades for copper, grades for brass, um, all kinds of different grades for stainless, aluminum, and steel. Steels, you know, you have your mild steel up to your high strength steels. In aluminum, you have your 3000 series, 6000 series, stainlesses, 304s, 316s. You can go up even higher in your 400s. And further, commonly requested shapes, you're going to see mostly round, square, rectangle. That's what we see a lot of. Um, but you do see your ovals. Um, and then now you're starting to see these. Um, companies getting into odd shaped designs. I've seen trapezoid shaped tubing, um, peanut shaped tubing, where it's actually almost like, like this. And they use that for frames. Um, and it's very tricky to bend this because now you have to create bend tooling to capture these odd shapes. And then also programming the laser on that is also very difficult. But you, you see customers going to this because due to the features and the design of it, it adds cross-sectional strength due to, due to its design. So you can have these, you'll see ovals, we've seen trapezoidal, uh, very odd shaped tubing. Um, when it comes to this, that's all direct mill by type material, so you service centers will not usually stock this material for lower quantities. So that's where you have to start working with the customer saying, you know, these are odd shapes, we're gonna have to go ahead and, and do a mill buy before we even start prototyping. So that's a challenge that would have to be overcome with the customer. Challenges and characteristics of the material, uh, you, you're dealing with elongation, tensile, and yield strengths of the materials. Any material that you're dealing with, those play huge critical roles in the forming process because if you don't have the elongation characteristics on the material to form it, you're going to have you're going to run into issues with 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 cracking, and when the material starts to crack, if your if your if your material properties aren't in spec, now you're on the hook for all that material that you've purchased that that doesn't even meet the spec to be able to form what it is you're trying to do. So elongation, tensile, and yield all play a role into that because it, it, 
your material will crack at a certain point, or it'll also play a role in, in deformation on the material. You'll, you'll find that it, certain materials will like to ripple more, and then you start to have to add extra tool to, to eliminate those ripples. And then applications, material types, just talked about. So then I'm gonna show you a couple videos of rotary freeform and multi-radius bending. And then we'll jump back into the slide. I just want you guys to see each video so you can have an understanding of what the process looks like. And then we can go over the tooling. So this is your most standard bend process. This is considered your rotary draw bending. The little clamp go in and grip the front of the material and bend it around a tool post bend die on a specific center line radius of, of, of the customer's choosing. And you can empty bend or mandrel bend. This is being mandrel bend. So that's rotary draw. And then we'll do, this is your multi-radius bending. So you can see we rotary draw. And then you'll flip. And you now you see there's rollers at the clamp which will give you a large sweeping radius. There gets to be a certain point where your center line radius that the customer is looking for is too large to what bend die you can get on your machine. And that's where you need to go to roller tooling to be able to execute those, those larger center line radiuses. What's the accuracy of those bends compared to uh, wiper dies? Well, the wiper die is, is sometimes used in the actual bending process, so I wouldn't say that the wiper die has anything to do with the tolerances. Oh, sorry, too many but, factor bends. Yeah, um, but when it comes to tolerances, depending on how many forms there are, there's always stack up on tolerances. So as you add bends, there's a tolerance per bend. And as you get to the end of whatever it is you're manufacturing, you have a stack up tolerance to that point. So we like to say standard over one form, plus or minus. You can hold downward up, you know, as low as 15 thousandths on a bend, but you're going to probably have some fallout at that point. So we like to say on average 30 to 60 thousandths. And we can usually hold 60 thousandths over quite a few bends, but as you start to get into those six, six plus bends, that's where you're going to start to want to increase your tolerances, 80 to 90 thousandths. And then full 180 bends, depending on the center line radius too, you'll have spring, ba spring back, and you have to account for that as well. So sometimes if the customer is really set on a certain tolerance, you have to, you'll have to re-machine a die to, to hit that tolerance on a 180. And then freeform bending, this um, actually uses just a ceramic die and it pushes the tube through. So you can create any type of radius um, that you program, as long as it doesn't collide with the machine. It's a very short video, um, but you can see it, it extracts out through a ceramic die in the front, not utilizing your standard rotary trellis. So this is the important slide here on tube bending. This is very, very critical when it comes to what it is you're looking to bend. So there's some main tooling that is involved in tube bending. And this is all based off rotary draw bending. The types of tools you need are pressure die. This is on the back side. This will follow the clamp die. Clamp die is what clamps into the insert on the bend die. This is your bend die here, and it's machined to a specific center line radius. And then right here is your insert, is what we like to call it. You can either have this be interchangeable, or you can actually machine it hard into the die for a specific job. There, and if you machine it into the die without it being an insert, you add rigidity to the, to the, to the die. Um, so you want to usually not use an insert on those tighter bends, like as you move down towards a 1D bend, um, you're gonna want to look at more so a machined insert. So what happens in the bend process, this pressure die rides on the back end of the tube following the clamp die. So as this clamp die is pulling the tube around the post and bend die, this pressure die follows, keeping the back side of the tube from kicking out. So. We have a die right here. This is your tube, right? 
And as it's forming, you have your clamp die that goes in, clamp die, bend die. Pressure die is what, well, sorry, it should be over here. Your pressure die comes in and pushes the tube, which keeps the tube linear and not wanting to kick out. What happens is that as the tube's forming around the bend die, the back side of the tube will want to kick out, causing bend issues. So this pressure die helps keep pushing the material linear and keeping from the, the back side of the tube from kicking out, which can cause manufacturing issues. You also have your collet. This is crucial. Um, just like any drill bit in your standard hand drill, you need to hold the tube. So any specific job you're running, whether it's one inch OD, two inch OD, they, you, need your, you need a specific collet to match that diameter or rectangle tube, square tube, whatever it is. That collet needs to match that tube to hold it and push it forward on a CNC vendor. Wiper die right here is also a key in creating good vents. Um, so as you increase, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. As you're bending, um, there's a standard term called 1D, 2D, 3D bending. Um, so that when, I'm, when I say 1D, that means the diameter and the center line radius are exactly the same. So if I have a one inch diameter tube bent on a one inch center line radius, that's considered a 1D bend. Now if I have a one inch diameter tube bent on a two inch center line radius, that's considered a 2D bend. And as that number increases, the easier it is to bend that product. So as that number increases, a lot of times you can get away without having a wiper die. As that number comes down and you start to create resistance on the front end, you need the wiper die to eliminate wrinkles. A lot of times when you're bending a tube with just a mandrel, you'll notice you'll have a little bit of a terminal hump on the, on the back side and on the, on the I should say on the front side of the, of the end of the bend is where you can sometimes see a terminal hump. But on the back side, you can get wrinkles or ripples, whatever you'd like to call it. And a lot of you don't want that. That's not what the customer is looking for. And the, the only way to get rid of that is by adding a wiper die. And again, apologize for my drawing, but the principle behind it is you have a bend die right here. And there's a gap, I would like to say right in here, and the tube's forming around here in this direction. So the wiper die, feathered in here, closes this gap. So the reason I'm pointing this out is when you're actually forming steel, it, it doesn't physically, you can't physically see it's turning they like to call plastic speed, where it's forming and it's, it's hot. If you take the tube out after forming it, it's gonna be really hot. The problem is, is as you're adding, as that bend, that 1D, or as you're getting closer to 1D, the difficulty of the bend increases, and the resistance on the front end is telling it, material stop forming this direction, I need you to find least resistance. So what the material likes to do is it says, okay, I got a nice gap right back here. I'll just start filling this gap in. So that's how your wrinkles occur. The material ends up filling this gap in and then pushes it through and the wrinkles form out and then you end up with a bunch of wrinkles in the back end. So the idea of the wiper is, and that's why the tip is really, really, fe it's feathered. It's a fine, fine, real thin end. If you dropped it, it would, it would, it would break. It's that, it's that thin. And the idea of it is to feather that into the tangent point of the bend and close this gap up, telling the material you can't flow into this, this gap, you need to keep flowing in a linear direction. So that's where that wiper plays a huge role, is to eliminate that gap. And again, it's not an issue on your, on your, larger, on your larger radiuses, but as you get down lower to that 1D bend, that's where you have to add a wiper. Um, and with that wiper, also a mandrel. Um, so here you can see this is what we call a three ball mandrel. Um, you can call it, this, this to me is what we would call an Amco bronze mandrel. Um, you can get chrome mandrels depending on the material you're, you're, you're bending. Um, you have to use this, you know, a chrome mandrel for your softer materials. And this would be used for your, for the harder material as well. 
Um, it wears away versus the chrome mandrel. Chrome mandrel doesn't like to wear this, so actually gives, it gives away a little bit more. But right here you can see the set three ball mandrel, and this body is the shaft, and you can actually just bend off of this. If we didn't have these three balls on the end, this would be considered a plug mandrel. And what you like to do is this tip, you want to have just past tangent point on the bend. Um, there's, a, there's a large math calculation to actually figure out the exact placement you would want. But there's a general rule where you want to place it, you know, you can start 60 thousandths or so past, depending on what it is that you're bending. But you always want to put that nose just past tangent point. And then these balls are what flow through the bend to keep, um, keep concentricity on the, on the, on the bend. Um, without these balls, you would have deformation in the bend. Um, a lot of times you'd have flattening on the outside and then crushing on the inside. But if you don't place properly, and this nose is past is behind tangent, you're not keeping that gap open, and then you end up tearing the mandrel off. The balls would get stuck in the bend. So the, the placement of the mandrel is critical when, when, when bending with balls, specifically because they, they will break off really easily because they're, they're only held on just little links. So to be able to rotary draw a bend successfully, bend die, which is basically your center line radius machined out. Clamp die, pressure die, and collet are needed for pretty much every bend you're gonna do in rotary draw. Mandrel, uh, I would say probably, oh, it depends. We're, we're a company where we mandrel bend everything, um, but you can empty bend. Um, it just depends on the customer, if the customer is okay with, with deformation in the bend. And then wiper die is used as you get to those, those tougher bends. Um, wiper die is not always needed, but it does help with the, um, the end result of the product that you're forming. Does anyone have any questions with the tooling so far? Yeah. When does the tooling actually, like, is it on the machine when you buy it? Or? No, um, so let me, I'll step back with that. So each job requires a specific set of tooling. So whether it's an outsource to get the machine, the, the dies built, or you have a tool room internally to, to machine them. Each job is specific. So you can have customer A call and say, I want a one inch diameter tube on a four inch center line radius. Okay, say you're a new shop starting out, you just got a vendor. You may have worked with the, with the manufacturer and they've included maybe two sets of tooling for you, or if you already had an existing customer, they would include that tooling for you. However, Every new job that comes through, you will need a new die to match that center line radius. You may be able to interuse pressure and clamp dies. However, every job is specific and will require a new bend die and specific mandrels to that job. Wall thicknesses play a huge role in your mandrel. Um, aluminum specifically, if you say you have a one inch OD2, 120 wall aluminum, you're gonna most likely need a, three mandrels all sized a little bit differently due to an ASTM standard of, of that wall fluctuation in aluminum. Aluminum, you see that the most. You do see it with steels and stainlesses as you get to that tighter bend. You want to close that gap up on the ID of the tube. And as you get closer to, say, maybe three thousandths on both sides of the mandrel to bend, now if the wall thickness fluctuates, say, 10, now you have a chance of that mandrel not fitting. So sometimes you have to have multiple mandrels just to bend one job. Did that help answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so kind of was talking about this already, but tube bending has a lot of challenges. Tight radii and 1D bends specifically, those are the hardest bends to achieve. Um, not only is an engineer looking at it on paper, it looks like any other bend, but when it comes to the actual manufacturing of a 1D bend, it's very difficult. That comes down to now your operator and the tool setup. Any of those go wrong, you're not gonna have a good part. And when we talk about all these, and just to bring it kind of to light for an operator and your operations that's running these, these parts and the products, you have one, two, possibly three, four. Uh, let's ignore this, this is not gonna be a, a variable. One, two, three, four, five. You have five tool variables, plus now all your setup variables, and your torque values, and your speeds on pressure die following. All those things play a role in the setting up, and if any of those are wrong, 
you will not have a good part at the end of that bending cycle. So that's where tight radii 1D bends, you have to have a good setup operator to be able to achieve those types of bends. Um, again, as that number increases, two, three, four, five, bends become easier. Tight radii, it's critical. Alignment, pressure die following speed, wiper, um, you can set rake on wipers as well. So that when you when you align a wiper in here, it's if it's in line parallel, it's considered neutral. But you can also adjust it to push out or to, to push in, and that's considered setting the rake on the wiper, um, which can all be adjusted. A lot of times you want to start at neutral and adjust that rake as seen fit. But again, that all comes down to the operator and what he's seeing with the finished good after he bends it. So as you can see, there's a lot of variables. So when I say it's, it's difficult, I've been in the sheet metal industry and, and, and press break work. Um, you, can, you can take what you've learned there and transfer it over to the tube bending world based you know, off of offsets and things like that that you have to account for. But when it comes to actual bending, setting up a tube bender, it's a whole different world. And it can be, it can be very difficult. I've, I've actually been part of startups where they've actually envisioned it being more like press break, come to find out it, it really is not. And it, it can be very um, costly to start up if you don't have the tooling and the um, employees to actually execute the, 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 the tubes that you're trying to form. Thin walled material is also a huge issue, which also plays a, a role into the degree of, bend, the difficulty of bends. Thin wall material, uh, so hole 35 thickness, considered thin, low on under, that's really thin. Um, and a lot of those materials, it plays a role in wall factor. As you're, so this is where it gets a little bit different. You have your difficulty of bend and your wall factor. Those are two things that you're gonna look at. As your degree of bend, 1D, goes down, the difficulty of the bend increases. As your wall factor goes up in value, increases the difficulty of the bend. So, they're, they're opposite of each other. So as your radius goes lower, it becomes difficult, and as your wall factor goes up, it becomes difficult. And the reason I say that is, think about cross-sectional tube. Just say three inches. If you have a 120 wall, the structure of that tube is, is it's stronger. You can't deform it with your hand. But now as you thin that wall up, say 035, 020, get into those 20, 24 gauge materials, you can almost crush that tube with your hand. Like you could start to flex it. And that's considered, that's where that wall factor plays a role into it. With that really heavy wall factor and a low degree of bend, you have to have very machine tight tolerance tooling. I'm talking like a thousand just to be able to make it work. Because you can actually deform the tube with your hands. So when you're working with a customer, a very low a 1D bend with a very high wall factor, say in the 60s, 70s, you're going to want to work with the tool builders or whoever, or if you can build your tooling internally, and work with the customer and make sure that you're looking at consumables at that point. You're going to wear out your mandrels, you're going to wear out your wipers, and you don't want to be caught paying for that up front and not charging your customer for that because there's no way around eliminating those consumables at that at that level because you're as the mandrel wears out you have to replace it because it will no longer work. Parts with existing holes and features that's very it, that becomes very tricky. Um, so when I when I say that a lot of tube bending is just saw cutting and then taking it to a tube bender and throwing a 90 degree bend on it. 45, whatever it may be, bending it multiple times. Parts of the existing holes features means we've taken a raw stick of material and we've either drilled holes in it or we've used a tube laser to process it, meaning cutting it to the length of the part needed, which we consider the developed length, putting holes and features in it where need be, taking it from the laser and then going to the bender. All those holes have to be orientated specifically to go to the bender so that after you bend it, all those holes and tolerances line up. And there's softwares, a lot of the machine builders now have really good software to account for, account for that, but you still have to 
still trial and error at the end. Um, calculations will get you really close, but you still have to trial and error, placing the holes, everything. So that, that's, that's critical for placement, but also as you get holes near bends, that plays an issue too. So the general rule is three times the diameter away from the tangent point of the bend to eliminate cracks, deformation, things, things such as that. So if you put a hole right near the bend, it's most likely going to either pull and create a cat eye or crack, or it could actually crush. And those are things that you obviously don't want because now the hole is it's unusable to the customer and it's out of tolerance. Large versus small runs play a huge role. That all comes into account because smaller runs, sometimes, you know, if it's two pieces, a lot of times you can make the tooling work with some adjustments with existing tooling if you have that specific centerline radius and mandrels to work for that job. However, as you increase your, your into a, a, a production run, now that tooling may not work or it may just not be feasible at the production level. So between large and small runs, you have to evaluate the job almost different, it, not almost, you have to evaluate the job differently. It's the same part, but it, it's gonna be manufactured most likely two different ways. And you have to account for that. Otherwise, the, you, you're gonna, you could either lose the business to customers because if you price them at a prototype run, obviously you're not going to get that production run. Correct tooling, um, that's a huge challenge like we talked about already. We discussed kind of the tooling and all the, you know, the wiper, the mandrel, all of that plays a, a critical role in executing a successful bend. And then you can also, um, I didn't touch on this, but you can add, you can also add to the clamp. There's, when you rotary draw, you always have to have straights between bends, and that can cause issues because general rule says you need a certain length clamp, a certain length pressure die, but you can cheat that. So say a customer has a three inch tangent straight between bends, but General rule tells you you need a six inch clamp. To be able to eliminate that or alleviate that issue, sometimes you can add knurling or serrations on the clamp to give it extra bite into the tube to eliminate that extra smooth clamp length that would be required to, to, to be able to bend that tube. The smooth board or smooth clamping allows for, for slippage. And if you slip, obviously your tube is gonna be out of spec. So you wanna eliminate that. And that's where that general rule on a certain clamp size comes into play. But you can cheat it by now serrating it, which gives it bite. But end result, now you've had serrations and it's biting into the tube, now it's marked. Can the customer accept marking or not? If the customer can't accept marking, well now you've added an additional process internally. Now you have to balk those marks out. So there's always, there's always a pro and con to everything you're trying to do when it comes to tube bending. Inspection. <clears throat> so, sheet metal, you can bump it up to a 90 and get your height. Tubing, you have rotations, different angles, and the next thing you know, you have six bends with 90, 45, 30, 40, rotation 60 degrees, 40 degrees, 30 degrees. Now, if you gave that to your quality inspector, they would have a heck of a time trying to get all that lined up to be able to give you a report on whether that part's in spec or not. So as a, so if, if you're a startup, the rudimentary tools are very difficult to measure that. You can get around it by using a design, you know, you can use SolidWorks to build a check fixture. That check fixture you can use then to then check the part. But again, it takes design time, it takes build time, and it costs you, it, it's a costly internal um, process to go through. What you can do is you can add sophisticated equipment to check tubing, but it's very expensive. They do make equipment, it's a large table, and it has a bunch of cameras on it, and it's all lit up, and you can literally just take the tube, six bends, 10 bends, whatever it is, set it in, and a click, in a click of a button, it will, it will give you all your dimensions. It will tell you all your straights, all your rotations, all your angles, and let you know. It'll give you a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether it's in spec or not. Very nice piece of equipment, but very costly up front. Um, that takes out the, um, a lot of the uh, inspection time that would happen in quality. They also make roamer arms, scanner arms, that you can also scan the product to, to check. Does anyone have any questions so far? Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> We're gonna go on 
to uh, two blaze ring methods. So there's different lasers out there. Um, what we're going to specifically talk about is your inline tube laser and then your five axis uh, laser. Um, so with tube lasers, there's what we've, what I've dealt with at least, and what most fabricators out there deal with are CO2 and fiber optic tube lasers. Uh, CO2 lasers are a little bit older technology, but still in the industry, they work really well for thick wall, heavy structural tubing. Um, you're may, you're, you can cut with nitrogen or oxygen, but mostly with a CO2 laser, you're gonna cut with oxygen. Your other laser you have is a fiber optic tube laser. That's using a fiber optic to take that laser beam and cut the product mostly. What you're using with a fiber optic tube laser is nitrogen, which is your inert, an inert gas, um, which helps eliminate your oxide layer. So when you cut steels with lasers, um, you cut with the sit. I mean, there's other assist gas too. You can have a mix, oxygen, nitro mix, things like that. But specifically, oxygen and nitrogen is used most often. Oxygen you use to cut thicker wall. It, it ignites, so it leaves an oxide layer. So a lot of times, you're left with a challenge to get rid of that oxide layer because it will chip off and create paint issues down the road. Where if you go to a uh, cut with nitrogen, it's an inert gas where it's just blowing the molten um, steel out, but it does not leave an oxide layer. It's a clean cut and you can paint right over it when you don't need any post-processing after laser cutting to remove that oxide layer. Um, CO2 is the fiber lasers. Speed is a huge difference. Fiber lasers are much faster um, on your thinner materials. A lot of times what you will see in that four to 6,000 watt laser range is right around 188 wall thickness is where you'll see a lot of your operators will sometimes have to switch over to oxygen to account for material issues or whatever it is because it, 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 it starts to cut cleaner and your, but your speed reduces. You can cut much faster with nitrogen on your thinner materials. So for a CO2 laser, for example, you'll probably see ranges in you know, max probably 150 inches per minute in cut speed. For fiber optic tube lasers, you can see in the thousands of inches per per minute. Um, so that's a huge difference when it comes to manufacturing a good. Um, you want to get it out your door as fast as you can. Throughput efficiencies is critical. So that's where the fiber laser, laser comes in handy. It's much quicker. But again, CO2s have their place. They're really good at cutting really thick, heavy wall tubing. You also have your multi-axis fiber optic lasers. Um, those are nice because unlike a straight inline tube laser where it takes a raw 20 foot you can, you can hand load a straight up to 28 feet. The machine will automatically load the tube into the line. It will measure it. It will figure that out, what the length is. And then it'll put it into the process line. It'll go through. It can actually check weld seam. It'll place the weld seam in location to where your holes are for bending. And it will also check for, um, it will also help. It has cameras and it'll help to center holes as you're cutting them too. So sometimes, in, with an ASTM spec, you're able, mills are able to fluctuate their their, their tubing in, in, in a certain spec, kind of like manufacturing. You have a spec that you have to, to manufacture within. So to account for that on tight tolerances for centering holes, you either have to have a probe come down to center that, or now newer lasers have cameras and they can just pick up where that tube is in orientation to the chuck and center those holes based off. Multi-axis laser, on the other hand, is taking a bent tube, deep draw fan cover, and putting it into the machine, and a laser will come down and post-cut holes, slots, whatever it is needed for whatever that, that product is going to be used for. So in, in the way it's usually done is straight laser bending. All holes usually have to be put in with a drill, or you have to go in and mill them, whatever it may be, with a vertical mill. That's very time consuming. Now, with new multi axis lasers, you can actually take your finished good, put it in, a laser will cut it, or it actually will have a robot too, and it can manipulate the part. So you can cut around, around bends, put holes in, um, or deep, like I said, deep drop covers, things like that. Um, it's really good at just. It, you're, you're basically programming in a uh, 360 degree free space environment 
and you can cut anything as long as you're inside that envelope. Consumables, what's needed for tube lasering. You have nozzles, you have lenses, glass, things like that. Those all play a role. In, well, and then you also have your gas. Um, it's all consumables that go into your hourly rate charge for a laser. Uh, so you have nitrogen or oxygen as your consumable. Um, you go through nozzles quite a bit. Um, you can go through ceramics, lenses, glasses, those such things. Um, I'm going to play two videos now. Um, one is the five axis tube laser and then one is the inline tube laser so you guys can get a idea of what those look like. I'll do the multi-axis laser cutting first. So what this is doing is we actually bent, we bent this tube and it's cutting out, it's a heat shield. So we formed this tube. And I'll just play it one more time. I don't think it actually showed the but what it's doing is it's cutting around the form tube, which is which you can't do if you put all those features in prior. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even be possible. And then your inline is all pre-laser cutting. So that's the main chuck, and then that's the laser head. A lot of your older um, lasers were all 2D. So the laser head couldn't tilt, um, so you always had issues with um, true holes. But now they actually have lasers that can now tilt, so now you can get true miters and true end cuts as well. Um, so a lot of lasers you'd always have to process the tube and all over the surface, which would give you a blunt front um, tip and um, a gap. So when a customer would take the part and made it up to another tube, so with tilt, when I talk about miter cutting with tilt, you can actually get a true 45 degree cut with a sharp. Most tube lasers in the past were all normal tube surface. And what would happen is this intersection point of the mating tube would work, but you would get a tube that would look something like this. And then up here you would have a, a transition point. And the reason I'm pointing this out is when you have a tube that mates up, there's a gap in here now and a gap down here. And it's an issue sometimes for your welder. Um, you have to put an extra weld to fill those gaps. Um, so it depends on the customer what their needs are. It's just very nice to have that tilt cut to be able to offer that to customers if they need it. <coughs> Just a question, did you, uh, in your wanderings, have you ever come across anyone using a five axis milling machine to do some of the work for, instead of a tube laser? Yes. Okay, I'm just yeah. wondering what the yeah. benefits yeah. are. Because I've, I've only seen tube lasering. I just, in the back of my mind, I always wondered, does anyone just use a regular The, di the difference, when it comes to a, a mill machine, a lot of times you have hard fixturing that you have to account for, which okay. takes design time and then also setup time for the laser. We can actually program it to just, as long as you have a zero point and you're setting that tube into the same spot every time, the robot will just go grab it and manipulate it. Okay. Versus where a mill, you need to hard lock it in, otherwise the part's gonna get tore out or, so yeah. there's that upfront cost that we can eliminate on the front side with, with laser cutting. So maybe the really high volume stuff would be okay, but not for medium or small volume. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, two laser cutting challenges. There's a lot of them. Focal position is one of the main ones. And that over there. This is your steel, let's just say. And now you have your laser head. And that's obviously going to come down, but your focal position is basically the beam. That's your focal position, and it's crucial for cutting material. 
because wherever that focal position is, depending on the material, you want to place that correctly. Um, but a good rule of thumb is to always start some placement in there, and that's all based off of zero to a positive or in the negative, wherever you'd be placing that focal position. Um, you can place it on the bottom side or high side as well. Um, a lot of um, the tech tables come with that pre-programmed, but a lot of times based on the material, you have to adjust those focal positions. Um, so, but that is one huge adjustment. It can cause burrs, uh, large, dr uh, large heavy draw speeds, if not positioned correctly. Weld seam detection, that's another huge one. So in bending, weld seam plays a critical role. Um, if you put the weld seam in the crush or the stretch zones of the two, um, if you put it in the stretch zone, sometimes the weld seam can actually crack open, but it also can affect your, um, your developed length. In bending, you need a developed length, kind of like you need a developed flat sheet metal. Weld seam detection plays a critical role in that because without a laser weld seam detecting, it would just place the weld seam all over the place. The problem with that being, there's three positions of a weld seam in tube bending. It's the neutral axis, um, compression, or in the, in the stretch zone. So when I say that, um, you have a vent tube like this. Um, so you're forming here and here, right? Stretching, compressing, and then the top side is the neutral axis. If you can, you want to place that weld seam in the neutral axis. Because now you're not forming or compressing that weld seam, which is a, a harder material. You've, it's a heat affected zone now because um, you welded it. So now that's harder material and it doesn't stretch or compress like the base raw material does. So you always want to try to eliminate where it is. And when I say eliminate it, put it in the neutral axis so you don't have to deal with it. If you put it in the compression zone, you're going to have issues with stretching and it's going to mess up your, de your developed length. Same with the stretch zone. It's going to play with your developed length and you could end up out of tolerance or you could end up cracking it. It's on the outside. So with a, with a tube laser, you can actually place the weld seam in orientation to the holes. So all that can be pre-planned up front. But you have to hold the weld seam detection. So that's crucial. So as the operator is running, he, has to pay, he or she has to pay attention to that weld seam orientation as the parts are coming out. Nozzle size, gas pressure play a huge role as well, um, depending on the material. There's different nozzle sizes, and there's different nozzle sizes from oxygen to nitrogen as well. Your nozzle size on nitrogen is going to be, the, the, the porthole is going to be smaller for higher pressure, um, most likely, um, but obviously it changes depending on your material types. Nitrogen's always higher pressure, you're always playing in that two to 300 PSI range, where oxygen, you're, low, you're in the low hundreds to even under 100 PSI. So that's where that gas pressure nozzle size plays a role. Oxygen, you're gonna have lower pressure, different nozzle sizes. Nitrogen, you're gonna have really high pressure and different nozzle sizes as well. And depending on material, material thickness type, that nozzle size changes. Nozzle centering, that's also critical. So in any laser, there's a collimator, and in there is where you have the adjustments for the laser beam. If that laser beam is off-center, now you're going to have issues with your cut quality, or, we'll, or just won't cut if it's that far out of center. So what every operator has to do with every nozzle change is they really should go in and do what, what, they, what we like to call a tape shot, where they put tape on it, and with a, um, a scope, they then look to see how centered that nozzle is, and then they can adjust that. You want that, that laser beam centered, as centered on that nozzle as possible. So it's a little bit of a process. It's a rudimentary, we call it a tape shot. Again, you're just putting tape on and the laser beam just does a quick shot. And you can see where the nozzle is and then you have to center it based off of that. Heat transfer, another huge issue in laser cutting. Um, as your cross section decreases, the heat can't escape as fast. So it holds, it holds heat and as that transfers down the tube, you start to lose your cut. Um, and you can run into stuff, serious cut quality issues. Um, I've had it in the past where we've taken on work where it's one, one, OD, one inch OD, 150 wall, mild steel, very, very small cross section of a lot of heat to cut that thick wall. First 20 or so parts cut really nice, but as that heat continues to transfer and it's not dissipating as fast as the heat is increasing, 
your cut quality starts to, to degrade. And the next thing you know, you're not cutting the material, you're actually welding it shut. So that plays, you have to keep an eye on, on, on that cross section of your tube. Again, it's, it's very small cross sections where you can't dissipate the heat fast enough. It travels down the tube, next thing you know, you don't have, you don't have any parts. It's not even cutting it at that point. You can't adjust for it, but that, that variable changes because you actually don't know the temperature of it. So if you'd make that adjustment, it probably would cut a few again, and then it would go, it would, you'd lose the cut because it just keeps continuing to build heat. So that is, that, that's critical. Also duty, frequency, and power. Frequency is how much energy you're throwing at the material. Duty is telling the laser how many times I want you to pulse it. You can do continuous wave where the laser is always on, high speed cutting, um, or you can do a pulse cut, keeps the laser, it's turning the laser on and off, so many times per second, but just enough to keep the material cool. <coughs> so you, you use pulse cutting if you're cutting through really thick material where you have to slow the laser down for intricate cutting. Um, you want to actually start pulse cutting. Where you can actually see the laser, it almost, it'll, it'll pop, 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 and you can actually see it spot shooting the laser as it's cutting. Um, so with that, kind of gone through everything, does anyone have any questions you'd like me to elaborate on? Just with regards to what you just went over for the two ways of cutting here, yep. you, you were primarily focused on, on steel cutting. Yep. What about other materials like copper or brass? Or um, so copper and brass, the reflectivity is higher, so you're going to want to stick with your, most likely your fiber optic tube lasers to cut those. Um, stainless steels actually cut really nice. They cut like a steel, even better. Um, you don't see issues with that. Now aluminum, that's a different issue. Aluminum is a softer material, and as you're cutting it, it's really difficult to get rid of the burrs. And those will actually, steel stainlesses, you'll get a nice rollover bead from your draws. Aluminum, you get actual sharp cut teeth that you'll actually have to deburr, and you can't really eliminate them completely. You can dial your cut in to reduce them, but most of the time, aluminum, you're always gonna have to do some kind of deburr operation. And then stainless also, you have your weld, you have your, your spatter from cutting, sometimes, a lot of customers are using stainless for, 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 for some sort of fluid to go through or whatever it is. Sometimes you have to actually apply a, um, a weld anti-spatter to the ID of the tube before you even laser cut it to eliminate that from sticking to the ID of the tube as well. So, so dimensional tolerance can be maintained then with regards to like OD and that sort of thing? Yes. Yep. With co even with copper? Uh, yes. Yep. And we can hold, uh, lasers usually can hold, I mean, you can hold down as tight. I've seen really dialed in laser, two and a half with fallout and a, and a full 100% full check on a fixture. But standard, you know, like to say, you can hold five thousandths on whole size up to that 10 to 15 thousandths. It's kind of that tolerance range on, on lasers. Yeah. Are we talking about everything you've shown, not just yeah, 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 any any questions? Yeah, going have. back to bending, yep. um, have you ever done a study or two now to figure out how much variance there is in the well thickness material after bending? Is oh. it fairly consistent or can you You will have you well will have the always you always have some thinning of the material on the outside. Even with No, I don't have variance between parts, like some Oh, uh, we we've never done a, a study okay. to uh, for me to be able to give a percentage on that number. But you're always going to have some thinning on, on, on the outside. But you, yeah, for structural engineering yeah. purposes. That's oh, that's, that's it's so critical, very much so. Uh, you know, what's the variance? So yep. You know. You have talked about the size of the nozzles relative to nitrogen cutting with oxygen. Can you just share with us the advantages of cutting with nitrogen? Um, there's there's quite a few. Um, so you have speed. Um, then you also have. Uh, you don't have an oxide layer after you're done cutting. Um, so with oxygen, you're, you're, the, the gas is combusting in the cut. So you're not just using the laser beam for the curve cut. The, the oxygen is also igniting, which creates an oxide layer, which eventually will chip off, which can cause issues at the end user because if that starts to chip after it's been painted over, it's, it's not a good road to go down the customer. Um, so even though the nitrogen may be a little more expensive, the ultimate cost could be lower because you have less secondary. Costs. Exactly, and then also you can make that up. So if nitrogen is a little bit more expensive, you're making that up in your throughput. So the same exact 
tube, say a one inch OD, I'm using one inch, this is it's very common, or 65 wall tubing. If you cut that with oxygen, you're maxing out at inches probably mid 100s, 100 inches per minute, where nitrogen at that wall thickness, we're now over a thousand inches per minute. So now your now your throughput on the machine is offsetting your nitrogen cost because instead of getting one part out every minute, you're probably getting four to six parts out per minute. That's great. Thank yep. you. Yep. Yep. Um, we, we, we can also do um, rectangular um, tube bending, mm -hmm. um, but I mean we'll have of course um, different tools on that. Yep. Um, our company is um, going to trailer manufacturing business. Um, we just want to know if there's an um, um, application or there's a high applicability of this um, machine. If we're going to go with that, uh, we're going to use it for trailer manufacturing. My, my question is um, would it be better to like um, have a tube then? Oh, and then weld it completely? Yeah, because um, I was proud, I just saw like a video that they cut the rectangular tube and then, 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 then uh, weld it. Yep. yep. That can be We, bro, are, I've done it both ways. Oh, I see. Um, so on the laser, you can actually cut the reliefs, and we've done it for prototyping and production. Um, actually, a trailer hitch. Mm -hmm. They wanted um, it bent on a very odd centerline radius. And when we approached them, we said, well, this is your cost to achieve that. However, we can cut the reliefs on the laser and then hand form it. And then you can close those up in your weld fixture when you're applying all the other components to it. And we ended up going that route versus actually bending it. Um, so you can go both routes. It's just you have to look at it from a, from a cost standpoint. Mm -hmm. As the quantity gets to a certain point, it sometimes it, 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 like if it doesn't go into welding at the end user, adding welding is probably a no-go for them. But I, we were lucky enough that the customer was going into welding, so they were just adding a you know a few welds to it, not creating a whole other operation. Um, so there's, that plays a role. You have to find out if the customer is going to welding. You can offer that. However, you're most likely going to want to end up going with bending because now you you put it in, it's bent and it's done, mm -hmm. versus adding an additional operation. But both do work. Uh, yep, we've offered, I, I myself have offered both scenarios. So. With the uh, peanut shaped tubing you're talking yep. about earlier, um, going back to the bending and laser cutting, uh, were you doing those operations on a peanut tube? Peanut profile? Yeah, yeah you well? can do that. Is there, uh, is there certain differences rather than just regular round tube? Uh, the programming really is what it comes down to. The tool, well, obviously, you have to have the tooling designed for that shape. And then also the program. The program is very difficult. A lot of your machine builders' software is designed for your, your rudimentary recs, squares, ovals, rounds. Um, that now you have to get into more. Now you're getting into more in-depth line code programming to go, to get through those the intricate the intricate design. Because trying to get a laser to, to, to get down in here and cut. It's very, it's very difficult, and then you also have to worry about nozzle interference and such. And for the science, so for some, we're usually using SolidWorks. Is there an add-in for uh, designing uh, tubing for that one, or because uh, or there's like a specific um, CAD that we have to use to design whatever way. to design tubes? Oh, um, you can use just, um, so we use basic, just SolidWorks mm -hmm. to, just to, to, to design a lot of our tubing. So but we can, do you have like a, do you purchase an add-in? Um, yeah, we do. Um, it's called TubeWorks. TubeWorks. Yep, that's a very nice add-in. Um, yeah. It'll take your, your, your model and it'll, it'll stretch it out and it'll give you a, a, a theoretical developed length mm -hmm. and it'll place all the holes where they need to be placed over those bedrocks. I see. Then, then and, the and, program it's an, and it's an add-in to SolidWorks. Yes, yes. Um, and then what we usually do is we 3D sketch all of our tube designs in SolidWorks. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll just get a customer drawing, not even just a CAD file with it. So we're a job shop, so we're not we're not OEM, but we still have to create a CAD file off that drawing. Yeah. 
to be able to program it. So we use 3D Sketch and SolidWorks, TubeWorks, mm -hmm. and then also you have standalone softwares from the machine builders for the vendors yeah. and lasers. And that would be for the programming side, right? Yes, that's correct. And it's, is it also integrated in SolidWorks in the programming side? Uh, no, it's no. not. Oh. No, no. You're, you're getting your CAD file from SolidWorks and then importing yeah. it into your, your programming software. You can also draw inside your programming software if you do not have a standalone CAD system. So if you have, um, I, TubeWorks is a standalone software. Um, I don't know what CAD, bot, CAD systems it all works with. I don't know if you can integrate it into Pro-E and such, but I do know for a fact you can integrate it into SolidWorks. And it'll take a Form 2 that has holes all over it, and you tell it what the material is, you give it the characteristics of that material, and you can get as in-depth as putting in all the mechanicals. And then it'll it'll calculate everything and it'll straighten it out and it'll place all those holes for you. So it, it it eliminates the rudimentary figuring out of orientation and placement over a bend after the bend stretches, which can be very difficult. So if it puts a hole, it would kind of squish it to yep. make it smaller, and then when we bend it, it would simulate it. It's not that smart. You have to you have to know that that hole is going to do something and then offset it to account for that. So if say your hole ends up in a cat eye you might want to offset it in the opposite direction so as it pulls, now it's just round. The software does not know that, but it is smart enough to know it will leave the hole there if it's close to the bend, but if it is in the bend, it will eliminate those because it knows enough to say, hey, you can't have your holes in your bend because you're either going to completely deform it or it's going to crack the material. Okay, but there's nothing that exists with um, something that simulates a hole within the bend? No, no there isn't. To your knowledge, do you think it's something feasible? Because I've been, I've been trying some things uh, on a two liter, mm -hmm. um, and um, I've been keeping like the material within the hole. I just cut and keep some wells uh, all around it, mm -hmm. and try to bend it while the material is still there. Yep. But so far, it's still tries and errors. Like above one inch hole, it deforms a lot. Okay. Below that, it's not so bad. Yeah. We can still fix uh, our stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I was just wondering if there's anything that can simulate kind of this because there's like thousands of parameters to work with on bending. Yep. But um, it's how oh, it's still trial and error really for us as well. There's there's yeah. nothing that um yeah, we have found too that if you really want to push the limit on what you're trying to do, what we have actually micro tabbed a hole and left that slug in there to help keep its integrity. And then after it's formed you just pop it out. Yeah, it, it sometimes helps, but not all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to mention, we had to go through that when we were uh, at tubing, and we had to do a mandrel ball pull through tubing to have an extrusion, and you have to have a cat's eye shape in there, or a little shape, and uh, we just had data from a whole bunch of different trial rooms, and then extrapolated it through all the parameters. Okay. So, well, it's not what we do also. Yeah, yeah we're going to do FDA and everything, everything on it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we end up not. <laughs> so. And then, uh, did that, was that helpful? Did that, was I able to answer that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that actually brings up another point, too, also, with mandrel bending. If you're laser cutting it, you really have to make sure your laser's dialed in. Otherwise, if you can't get that mandrel in there, then you're going to have some serious problems again. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you micro-tab, so say, you have all that tooling. Sometimes the actual finished good is so short, you can't get the actual finished part out pass with the pressure die vectors. Sometimes you have to add extra material just to be able to form that good out. So sometimes you actually will micro joint that end on. So you have that actual extra material there to push it. You can also utilize push sticks, things like that. But sometimes you'll have to actually micro tab that material on. Now if the laser cut's not dialed in and now you have a bunch of hard internal draws, now your mandrel can't fit. So all those parts that you cut that now go to the vendor are scrap. Unless you can get in there and actually divert it, which sometimes those micro joints or holes that you're cutting are so deep in the tube, there's no way you can even get in there to divert it to be able to get the mandrel in. So, it's another, it's another huge issue that can come into play when tube lasering and tube bending. So. Uh, I'm, I'm not 
too sure if you went through the different, this is for your company, what the different sizes are that you've dealt with for like OBs, oh. all thicknesses for some of these operations. So, as, as general, I mean, you can bend anything. So there's wire formers that go down to, you know, your eighth inch, oh, yeah. you know, wire, and they'll go form that. Um, us specifically, we bend down a quarter inch all the way up to six inch OB. Is there a limit on laser cutting, like for instance? Yeah, so, in so as you're working with the manufacturer, you can size the machine to what, what you're looking for. Obviously, there's there's parameters. They, they only max to a certain point on, on a model, and then they, they, to the low end. They, okay. But um, so for us, our lasers are half inch to six inch OB or six inch square. Half um, inch. Okay. Yep, yep. It can actually go to. Now you can get big jumbo lasers that can go up to you know, 20 inch OB um, or bigger. Or you can even reach out to your manufacturer whoever's building that laser and they'll custom build it. If you're an OEM, you're looking for you know, a product line that's gonna go through, say it's 12 inch OB, you need a specific laser, you can reach out to them and custom buy something. If, it's, if you have like, you know, a 10 year lifespan of that, that product line. And then you can get other options like kill the cut, and stuff like that, so, yeah. Um, OB, the best process for bending, if you're very size, you'd almost need to go to a completely different piece of equipment to achieve those smaller bends at an efficient rate. I mean, you can bend real small stuff on larger equipment. It's just, it's going to be really slow. There's a lot of companies out there that for those really small hoodies that build wire formers that can bend product in, you know, five, ten seconds. You can whip out six bends in like ten seconds, where a large rotary draw bender, I mean, to do six bends on a three-inch bender is probably going to take so, so if right now, depending on the bend that we have, mm -hmm. it can be up until like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Oh wow. Um, because it's still pretty manual, mm -hmm. uh, but we're trying to incorporate the laser with bending. Okay. But um, what we do is pretty custom every time. So, so we just want something that... Are you using the CNC bender where you have a, where you have an x-axis pushing the, the tube as you're bending it, or do you have to have a hard stop for every bend setup that you're doing on your uh, uh, okay. So we have like a three die that uh, just someone passes the the, the, the pipe inside. Okay. So you could look at CNC control equipment with that automatic X, which would help probably draw your time way down mm -hmm. instead of because what happens with your hard stop is you have a bend and you got to set up for that. So now you're going to go in and bend. Okay, say you have a lot size of 120, you're going to set it up, bend all 120. If you, I'm just saying if you have one machine, if you have an assembly line where they're set up, then you do the one bend, two, second, third. But a lot of times you only have one bender to do the job, you set up, bend them all, then you gotta reset up again to do bend two, then you gotta reset up to do bend three, and four, five, and, on, and so on. Where if you have a CNC control with an automatic x-axis with a chuck, you could do that whole entire operation in one shot, as long as there's no um, interference at the machine. Say startup costs. You can get in. You can get a mill. You can get in a mill and grinding for. If you're, it depends on the, on the mill. Obviously, there's a range of yes. low end mills to high end mills. But let's just say, all in quarter million for really good equipment. Now, laser, on the other hand, now you're you're looking at you know, upwards of 1.25 million. So as a smaller company, that upfront investment can be 
hard to digest if, if they don't have that business yet they're justifying that. I mean, a lot of times I say, if you have it, the business will come because if you're doing it that rudimentary process, there's a, you get to a certain quantity where now your cost is so high compared to the guy down the road that has a laser. So if, if the production's there, you're gonna wanna upgrade to a laser, but if, if it's lower quantity and, and you're finding that you have a customer base that's willing to pay for it, then that, you can still go that route. But I think that's the, the issue with smaller companies a lot of times is that really high upfront investment with, with lasers. You can find, obviously, used lasers for cheaper, but if you're looking at it apples to apples from new mill, new laser, you're talking probably almost a million dollar difference. And in terms of profit margin, that means there are high barriers for entry, mm -hmm. which logically I can infer that profit margins are higher in this because even the clients will not get many shots to do that. Exactly. Yeah, you, your, your profit margins will, you can increase them because if now you're competing against some of that, they're expecting that cost to be much higher than what you're actually even so there's, there you can increase your margins now based off of that. So a lot of our lower quantity run type work, we're seeing anywhere from 40 to 60% margins. Gross. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But that's also, that's also working in a niche, a niche market, so, yeah. which tubing still is to some degree. You have a lot of sheet fabricators out there, but not a ton of tube fabricators yet. So I really think, you know, in, and the design with tubing is, is, is stronger too. It's, it's a cross-sectional tube. So a, a, a structure built off of tubing versus sheet metal, strength-wise, I think I'm gonna go with the tubular structure over any type of sheet metal structure based off of that extra strength just from that cross-sectional. In terms of the equipment, does any sheet uh, equipment can also be tubing? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're two different separate but you can you can get equipment that does both. Okay. It's just not as efficient if you just do a straight sheet laser and a straight tube laser. If they do make equipment that can switch both, it's just a lot of ones I've seen don't have the big bundle loader. Like a lot of straight tube lasers, you can take a whole mill bundle, throw it in the loader, snip the ties, and the laser will take take care of it. Um, so it, it, it helps. Back to the yeah. bundle, the quality of tubing is good enough that those machines are handling that pretty consistently with no issues? Yes, um, as long as it's within the ASTM spec, and obviously if it falls out of that, you have the ability to reject the material. Um, the only time we have, you see issues is um, a lot of times it's the camber in the tube that causes the issue. Yeah. So uh, sometimes, I mean, to alleviate, alleviate that, sometimes you, so if you have a 24 foot tube and you're loading it into the laser and it has a it almost looks like a banana when you lay it on the ground. Yeah. Um, the lasers, the newer ones are pretty good, but sometimes they'll still air out on you. And what we found is um, it reduces your throughput. So instead of maybe 180 parts an hour, you might go down to like 120. But uh, you can cut the stick in half to help alleviate some of that camber. And then the laser should be able to take control of it again. More problems with angle. Hmm? More problems with angle. Yes. Yeah. And you have to hand load angle. You can't bundle load channel angle because they like to interlock with each other and the laser the laser system loading system doesn't know how to obviously break those apart to load it yeah uh, in terms of the heat transfer you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, is there no way we could use some sort of a dielectric or a, like a significant you know, high heat transfer phenomenon within maybe extraction mm -hmm. or something which can I don't know, I mean, I'm just trying to... There, there, there are ways around it. We've actually, in the past, I've actually looked at a standalone system that's to blow really high pressure, uh, cold air on the, but, but then now, now you have, um, you have, you have um, material, uh, it's a, it's a heat, heat shock, you have a shock on the material, so you have to be really careful with that too. Um, but we were investigating it. There's, I work in a job shop where, and that's kind of my history where efficiency and getting those parts done is crucial. So instead of investing in that equipment, it just ends up going to, all right, for this cost, let's just go ahead and saw cut it now and just drill a hole. So that's what we've usually done is if we've seen heat transfer issues a lot of times, if we can do it under the same cost, we just change processes and how we handle it. 
Not often, but it's it's really your really tight cross section is where you're gonna have your heat issue. As that opens up and the wall's thinner, you don't have any issues with that. What percentage of the walls have It's hard to do. Yes. I mean, it's at that point where you, where it literally could be in a lathe or a mill or the laser. It's kind of a force of piece and how you, you're hitting that real fine line where it could go either way. If it was very, very high percent of your job, I'd probably use that. Yep, exactly. But you just don't see it enough. It's like, hey, let's just do it a different way. Yep. So in two bending, I, I, I know a lot about it, but I don't know all of it. Um, have you ever? across or use uh, sort of lubricants and is there downsides and pluses to them? Oh yeah, we use uh, bending lubricants. You can, wear, you can use oil-based, water-soluble. We, we use water-soluble because we find it's easier for the end user or us to take it out. Okay. It, it, it just helps, it, it comes out quicker if it's water-soluble, it cleans out your clean thing, your wash tanks. Okay. But yes, you can dry bend, but you have issues. Mandrel sizing is huge. Um, it'll actually weld to the tube. Okay. If you don't have that in there, um, you can either paste it on, yeah. or they actually have vendors that auto loop through the mandrel. Oh, so there'll actually be little ports in the mandrel body, and it'll it'll you'll have a loop system in the back of the mandrel rod, and it'll push loop through. So as you're bending it, you can kind of control how much lube is being applied per bend. So, and that's at the machine level where you can say, all right, I want you to lube every 15 degrees of bend, 40. Degrees. Any other questions? Sorry if you cut it. But CO2 versus fiber laser, just a plate laser, heat laser, it, is there any um, advantage if you get a CO2 versus a fiber? I would say your thicker materials is where I would say a CO2 is still going to be better than a fiber laser. But fiber lasers now, especially on the sheet side, their, their wattages are increasing. So now they're able to cut through inch steel. Oh, so 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 yeah, no problems. So now, now the CO two is, I would say, is you know, you don't need it that much anymore. But in the tube world, we're still not at that twelve to fifteen thousand watt. We're we're still kind of yeah. maxed around that six thousand watt where yeah. you hit that quarter inch and you're kind of capped off with nitrogen and you have to switch over to oxygen. You just do not have a plate laser. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not tube, yeah. yeah. Plate laser. So then. Does fiber also solve the, the edge for painting? Yes. Well, yeah, because you, you're, you're cutting it with, with, with nitrogen mostly, so you don't have that oxide layer. So if you go back to air, then you have that problem come back? Or you, know, you do, but you can you can actually do a mixed gas to help alleviate some of it, but you're always going to have, as long as you have some sort of oxygen in there, it's igniting in the burn and creating that, that layer. Where nitrogen, it's inert, it's not, it's not Combusting and it, you're using just that's why the pressure is so high with nitrogen compared to oxygen. Oxygen is almost it's 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 burning up some of the material as it's igniting. Where nitrogen, you're using 280 psi to just blow the molten steel through that curve cut. Right. So that's why the pressure is so much higher compared to oxygen. Thank you. Yep. Um, because you can kind of, you can do, manufacturing, I would say you can do anything. CO2 is so slow compared to a fiber. I, what are my skills then? Because most of these, when I acquire a machine shop, yep. and you know, you bolt on and you, you operate on that, is it just better, you know, waiting for two, three years until you save up the funds to get a fiber laser? Or because fiber lasers are there in the market, and mm -hmm. CO2 would be now outdated cheap, is it advisable you get that quick and start offering it, but I don't want to be limited that mm -hmm. completely you know, useless now. So if there is a 10-15% gap, and that's a new bit of under parts that I can wait and find, but the cost is like one fold, then expect. Mm -hmm. That's the question I mean, I'm trying to... What, what material thickness do you think you foresee yourself dealing with? Because CO2 is going to be great for your thicker materials. 
and it's and now at your speed and how many parts you can do per hour, as you increase your, your, your thickness, that fiber laser is going to slow down to that CO2 speed. So as you get to that quarter inch and above, yeah. now your CO2 and fiber are closer. Now your fiber rapids and its rapid movements on clamping and all that may, may have that advantage, but the actual cut speed is almost spot on the same. <coughs> Um, but now as you get to your thinner materials, like 0, 0, 065, 0, 049, you, you don't want to cut with a CO2 laser. Because uh, you're going to, you're probably, that, that it's probably 10 parts to one at that point. How much, that much faster. Because you're talking 100 and some inches per minute on the CO2 to 1,000, 1,200 inches per minute on the, on the, on the fiber cutting with nitrogen. But if you have the ability to get a CO2 and start bringing in some business, I would never hesitate while you wait for a fiber. I was in that situation a while back where all we had was a CO2. We were bringing in work, but we were losing on that market with the fiber laser. And that's where I mentioned to the company, I said, hey, we're losing so much business not having a fiber laser. And with seeing that amount of business you could generate with the fiber, that's what drew us then to then purchase fiber lasers moving forward so we could capture that side of the industry, <coughs> which you can't with the CO2 laser. CO2, I'd like to say, is really good for structural, really thick, thick material. Fiber, lighter, smaller. I would say like 70, 80 percent of the demand in the market will still be fulfilled by CO2 on the thicker stuff. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Did that help? Did that, was, that it, was that able to help? Uh, yeah. Yep, perfect.